Welcome everyone to Choosing the Right Load Cell Calibration System. My name is Henry Zumbrun, President of Morehouse. I'm hoping you become a customer of ours if you're not already. Uh, we are passionate about making good measurements, so I'll be giving you every bit of information I can. And there's a lot involved in selecting a cost-effective load cell system that will meet your measurement needs. And hopefully today we can go over a little bit about load cells. Um, we can go over uh, some other things like adapters. And then we can finish with a conversation on meters and, and the selecting the right equipment. There's my contact information there. It's H Lumbert and MH Force. And there's a mug. If you are on this, uh, we will be relaunching our mug shot uh, for the summer. If you don't have one of these mugs and would like one, uh, please follow us on LinkedIn uh, because that's where the announcement will be for the mug shots. And then we send out a mug shot and send a picture and we get a community going just kind of fun. We did it last summer and it was uh, fun. So we'll be doing that again. So what Morehouse does is we manufacture force calibration products, adapters, load cells. We also ma manufacture torque uh, stuff as well, but this one's more for force. Uh, we calibrate force measuring equipment with standards, very low uncertainties. Our dead weight machines, some of them have uncertainties as low as 16 parts per million or 0 0.0016%. And these standards allow us to lower the uncertainties of equipment sent in to us for calibration and we help labs make better measurements and today we're here to the difference in load cell types indicators adapters and calibration providers so how i have to ask some questions people can think about during this webinar webinar which are are you confident that you have the right equipment for the force measurement task as a hand did someone just submit something to purchasing or a large corporation to purchasing just buy what they thought was the best deal and now you have equipment you're stuck with and it doesn't perform as well as you need it to and you start looking at reliability and at, after a year it doesn't meet the specifications you need so now the now you have to shorten the cow interval where it would have been cheaper to buy the right equipment that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about is your indicator stable when no force is applied are you sending in your adapters so that every they are used during calibration is your calibration provider able to meet your accuracy or equipment uh, calibration requirement? And how, how do you know they can meet them? Did you, is it just a matter of I looked at their scope, it, they seem to be okay? Or, uh, hey, they can make measurements to this and we need this. Can they do it? Uh, a lot of these things are not answered, uh, typically, uh, at least of what we found. And we find a lot of incomplete purchase orders where people try to request something. It's, uh, it's a tough business because no matter where you go, you pay money for calibration. I don't know anybody that's doing it for free. So then the question becomes, well, how much do I pay for calibration? Do I pay X amount to this company or this company? And who does it right? Do they have the stuff to do it right? Well, this company is 20% cheaper, right? If I get it calibrated, it's good, right? And these are just all types of things we need to talk about in, in all of and specifically in this webinar, we're going to talk about the types of load cells and their benefits and faults and choosing the right load cell system. So four steps. That's the title of the webinar. Choose the right load cells for your needs. Choose the right indicator. Choose the right adapters and choose the right calibration provider. A little bit about load cells. They're composed of something called strain gauges. And when we talk about strain gauges, what are we doing? Uh, we're measuring the amount of deformation of the body due to applied force. More specifically, we're measuring the fractional change in length. So we put a bunch of these strain gauges on something, and we push on it, or we pull on it, and that length changes. And it's a device whose electrical resistance varies in proportion to the amount of strain on the device. To measure small changes in resistance, strain gauges are almost used in a bridge configuration with a voltage excitation source. Here's a picture. Uh, it's a rather older picture. We were making a 1 million pound load cell out of discount 44 bar stock. And I, we took a lot of pictures during this process, tinning the strain gauge, solder taps, uh, you know, wiring the bridge, removing XX, SX, uh, XX solder flux, um, and then, you know, ground, adding some grounds. And then uh, the last was putting it all together and preparing for testing. Uh, that load cell was a million pound load cell. I went to NIST and had a ASTM lower limit factor that, of about just under 100 pounds of force. So for us, 
it was decent at the time. Like I said, it was years and years ago. Since then, we've upgraded uh, our load cell and capability to a sh uh, more of a standard shear web type at a million pounds. And our lower limit factor now is about 20 pounds or less. So the load cell we use now is five times better than this one that we made back fi probably 15 some years ago. The uh, strain gauge, most load cells are forced to use a series of four resistance arms with an excitation voltage and it's applied across the bridge. Some manufacturers will also use dummy gauges to eliminate temperature effects. It's important to look at the manufacturer's temperature specifications to determine if the load cell is temperature compensated. Here's just a picture of a Fluke 8508 in one of our ovens with several terminals where we can characterize, we have boards where we can characterize the temperature and, and Put in resistance. This this specifically application is for our uh, new shackle pin type load cells. Multiple strain gauges are often used to measure difference in voltage between the two signals. And some people even say the strain gauge is the heart of the load cell. It's really we have to get this right. If we do not get the the placement of it right, our load cell is not going to perform well. So oftentimes what separates a good load cell from a great load cell is just someone that's very meticulous to put the gauges in very, very, very well. And then we talk about a load cell. I like this definition. A load cell is a force sensor that receives a voltage excitation from a regulated power source, typically a digital indicator signal conditioner, and sends back the low voltage signal when force is applied. And when it's the load cell signal is converted to visual or numeric value by the digital in indicator. Here we have a picture of a Hattie. And when there's no load on that load cell, the two signal lines are at equal voltage. As load is applied to the load cell, the voltage on one signal line increases very slightly, and the voltage on the other signal line decreases very slightly. The difference in voltage between the two signals is what is read by the indicator. Then we start looking at load cell terminology. So now we've defined the strain, what strain is, the fractional change of length, and then we've designed strain gauges at which we put on our material and our load cell. It's very important to match the right strain gauge to the material. Uh, that's some of the manufacturer. Very important to get the right temperature compensation done. And now when we do all this, you start to test load cells. And when we test them and we look at certain characteristics, we look at a characteristic one called creep, which is the change in load cell signal occurring with time under load and with all environmental conditions remaining constant. Another load cell turn, we look at nonlinearity, and that's the algebraic difference between the output at a specific load and the corresponding point on a straight line draw between minimum load and maximum load, normally expressed in units of percentage of full scale and commonly characterized between 40 and 60 percent. It's important to note here that some manufacturers on their spec sheets use higher order equations. I'm showing a straight line here and that's going to yield a more conservative estimate of nonlinearity than if you use a quadratic equation because a quadratic equation can kind of curve the line. Uh, Meaning this one, instead of a straight line, we could do a nonlinear definition where we curve the line. And if we curve the line, guess what? That specification is going to be a whole lot better. But general industry, uh, from what we've seen, is using a, a best fit straight line. And that's what we're doing. And because it's curving it is kind of a practice that might kind of uh, convince people that uh, someone's load cell is better than someone else's when in actuality it isn't. So we need to compare everything using the same math equations. And then we have hysteresis where the algebraic difference between the output at a given load descending from maximum load and the output at the same load descending from the minimum load. And there's a lot more things to look at on the spec sheet, uh, temperature compensation. But these were kind of the major definitions that uh, to, to talk about today when selecting it, the load cells. I would like to talk more about reproducibility of the results and things like that, but that's, and those are often not found on a load cell spreadsheet. Like how well if I take this apart and put it back together, does it repeat? You might find a non-repeatability that's, you know, typically loaded to the same point, nothing's changed, no conditions are changed, and then that's specced out. 
we'll talk about that later in the characterization of load cells. We have uh, types of load cells. We have a column load cell, single column or high stress load cell, they're sometimes called multi column, S beam or S type, button or pancake, and shear web. There's several more types than this. These are just the really common ones that we see daily in our lab. And then on a column load cell, the spring element is intended for axle loading and typically has a minimum of four strain gauges, two in the longitudinal direction and two oriented transversely. Advantages of the column load cell, physical size and weight, you can make them small. If they, typically they need to be made pretty tall, just the, if you look at the material and where you're gonna gauge them, they're usually gauged in the center section. And it's not uncommon to have a million pound load cell weigh less than 100 pounds, which ergonomically, if I need to make a million pound, uh, calibrate a machine to a million pounds, you know, having something that I have to carry around that's under 100 pounds is, is possible uh, for a setup, as opposed to a shear web load cell that would be well over 300 plus pounds. Disadvantage, rep rep reputation for inherent nonlinearity. Uh, their sensitivity to off center loading can be high and the hardness of a pad, meaning what is sent in with that load cell. If I send, if I do not send the adapter to my calibration provider and they use their adapters, you, you could have variation by as much as we've measured about a half percent. So really, really important that the uh, top cap be sent in with the load cell. And these typically have larger creep characteristics than other load cells and often do not return to zero as well. And, you know, they, some spec sheets have that uh, specification on uh, zero return or relative creep error. Uh, they labeled as different things. Disadvantage, larger creep characteristics. What that does, if you look at this, here's two examples of uh, column load cells. And you look at this down here at the bottom, the return to zero of these two load cells. The one had a return of 0.255% and the other one 0.0083. The 0.083, this is not that many counts overall, but the 0 0.0255, 358 counts, it'd say this cell is gonna be problematic depending on how you use it. If you ignore the ending zero or you factor in the ending zero, the ending zero is high and it has quite a bit of error associated with it at uh, 0 0.255. When I was talking about the top caps, you see the difference of top adapters, really wanna look at this. Did this test back in 2017 on this load cell and just use two different adapters. This is, uh, the adapters were not initially sent with the load cell and so we used our adapters and then those adapters were returned and we did a lot of testing over several days and this was very very repeatable of a difference of about 0.3 percent throughout the range by just using different hardness of material now someone said i'm throwing a lot of numbers at people and they say well you know what's 0.3 percent well the expectation here at capacity is this load cell is better than 025%. So this is at least a magnitude of 10 times worse than what's expected. And when you use the proper adapters, you can maintain that 025. But if we are already have a difference or bias just from top adapters, that's not counting reproducibility and the other stuff of 0.263% uh, at capacity, it's not gonna get better than that. You're not gonna make a measurement that's better than 0.26 unless you account or correct for it or figure it out. And the way to do it is just to send the top top adapter in with the load cell or have us make a top adapter for, for that load cell. Multi-column load cells, these can be compact. These can also be lightweight. In this type of design, the load is carried by four or more small columns, each with its own complement of strain gauges. The corresponding gauges from all the columns are connected in series to the appropriate bridge arms. If you look at here, here we have our, you know, different strain gauges mounted in the different directions, uh, longitude and transversely. And typically these load cells are gonna have many more strain gauges, maybe four per post. So 16 total, our averaging gets a bit better when we have 16 versus four. And it leads to advantages in this design, uh, which they can be more compact. And they have, because of this, they have improved discrimination against the effects of off axis load components. 
And these cells typically have less creep and have better zero returns. Zero return showed here. After 30 seconds, this, this load cell is awesome. This is our 600K mini. Uh, but after 30 seconds, the zero return 0.003%. And then in many cases, the properly designed shear web spring melon can offer greater output, better linearity, lower hysteresis, and faster response. Multi-column load cells. I threw this in here. I train it. And it's just a show about flat. When you're, when you're looking at load cells, we want load cells with a flat base. If I have a, there's rocker cells and some other load cells, they're more difficult to calibrate. But typically, what I'm showing here in this example is when the base wasn't flat, there was about four, four plus times the amount of error uh, throughout the range than when the base was flat. And then the expectation is 025, and when we had a flat base and did the calibration with rotation, rotated it around in our machine, uh, established a, a better reproducibility of the device, we got within the 025 that's typically expected or better. Bottom plates, a flat bottom plate may be needed to improve performance. Not always needed, but it's a good good recommendation, and it's often not recommended to practice the load against the machine surface, as it could be uneven, or the base of the load cell should deform the machine surface. And if we look at a kit that we have, this is our concrete kit, a 600K load cell, a 60K TNC load cell, uh, the 600 is compression only, and then here we have a five, someone could purchase a five or a 10,000 uh, load cell to round out the kit tension and compression. But remember when I said about uh, a flat block to prevent deformation on the machine? That happens. Here's one of our load cells. A good friend sent me this picture uh, and they didn't use the bottom plate. And guess what happened? Right here, this is their machine. Our load cell, very strong steel here, which is much stronger than the bottom block of this machine. And now you can see that load cell space permanently deform the machine. Another example of, adap of when adapters are not used in machines. Look at this. This is a cow machine. The sad part of this is it was a reconditioned cow machine that then came, was reconditioned, I think, back uh, five or six years ago. And you can see they didn't pay too much attention to the guidance that was given. Um, not good. Not good in practice. And almost to the point of you can say, eh, this is a good example of uh, customers, if they would see this, a good example to say how to guarantee your customers might find a new vendor if you're loading on surfaces that are not flat that should be flat. Then we have an S-beam cell. Uh, it's typical design used in weighing um, applications. Four gauges placed inside the beam typically. You can see denoted up here. These load cells, pretty symmetrical uh, in general. Uh, linearity will be enhanced. So that deviation from linear, it's really, these cells are typically really, really linear. Um, and ideal for measuring small forces uh, when physical weights cannot be used. Their disadvantage of S-beams, uh, they are cheap, uh, which is good, uh, but the big disadvantage is they are very sensitive to off-axis loading and ideally suited for scales or tension applications, the scales where they can be mounted in place. And then compression output will be different if the cell is loaded through the threads versus flat. We look at this, I do this picture a lot in training. This S-beam here, just slightly misaligned, very hard to tell in the picture. And if we look at it, the output, just the sheer difference in output from slightly misaligned, this is one of the worst S-beams we've seen. But slightly misaligned to misaligned, there was a change in 0.572%. What that means is we calibrated here, use everything, align it very, very well established and expanded uncertainty at the time of calibration about nine about 10 pounds uh, we could say that's the expected performance of the load cell when used under like or similar conditions and then someone goes and they put it in a machine and they slightly misalign it well if they slightly misalign it that 10 pounds becomes 85 pounds which is probably no bueno right for those that are out there no good no no good and the other thing with S-beams, here's a, hopefully a takeaway for everybody that's listening to this and watching it, 
is you should be asking your customers how they're loading them. If we load it both thread loading loose both ends, the output is symmetric, which means the tension and compression numbers typically match better. Though if a customer is not loading it that way, that's this, this example right here, uh, and most of the time we find that customers are loading it somewhere. Uh, this one, this one is uh, thread loaded on top, flat on base. This is what we find is the most common when we ask. But here we have loose both ends, tight both ends, thread loaded on uh, top, flat base on the bottom. Flat on flat is another method right here. And if we look at this, these differences from the smallest to the maximum, uh, just between different loading conditions. If our goal is 025, we're not getting it. Um, if we load it a different way than what the end use is. Maximum difference was 0.369 or like 0.298 at capacity. So if someone's expecting something to be better than 025, this is showing they could be as far out like 12 times that. Uh, so it's rather large errors on S-beam load cells in compression depending on the way they are loaded. So you really want to ask your customers if they're using these type of load cells, how they're loading them so you can best replicate it. Now we have adapters, we have alignment plugs, it's machined holes that can help everybody center things. So this type, uh, then we get to a button load cell and often use what we find in weighing applications. Uh, the load cells on the left exhibit a high errors for misalignment. Any misalignment on this is going to produce a high error. The cells on the right are generally better. They're made by HBM. They make nice small cells. And some of them, some of these cells typically have errors between 1% and 10%. The spec sheet's not going to tell you this. You're going to look at the spec sheet and think you can order this load cell. It's not going to tell you that as they heat up, the output changes pretty much. It's not going to tell you that if you slightly misalign it, it will look like a completely different load cell than if it's perfectly aligned. If you don't, if you do not have the right adapters to calibrate it, it will look absolutely horrible. So that just demonstrated, if we look at this setup, here's flat on flat loading. And if we just look at the percentage of error of this device, 1% just rotating it which my good friend Dillip says you can have your head in an oven, feed in ice, and on average, you can still feel fine. Uh, the average is pretty decent, right? If we look at the three numbers, zero degree, 120, and two, we get 2008. Compare that with a well-aligned setup over here, and the averages are about the same. So if we just based it as a... If I make these, manufacture these, if we base everything on the averages, they look really, really close. But when you start looking at reproducibility characteristics of the device, one, without the right adapters, max deviation of 21 versus 4, error 1.045 versus 0.199. So if you're buying this type of load cell, you might want to really look at the application it's being used in and figuring out how to put the right adapters in place so that your results are meaningful. Otherwise, we've seen people buy these with and think, oh, they're good to 0.1%. In actuality, they're lucky if they get 1%. There's some adapters that we have for both washer and button cells. Other one we have here, my favorite load cell probably the bunch, and this is uh, most accurate when installed on a taper base with an integral threaded rod installed right here, integral rod. A lot of manufacturers show pictures of these load cells without this installed, which is a travesty because it's just not very good without that installed. Uh, the depth of the thread makes a big difference when this is locked into place. We are, this load cell is very repeatable. You can put different adapt, different uh, hard, you can even put different some different hardness blocks on it. You can side load it a little bit, and it works very, very well. And uh, it says here very low creep and are not sensitive to off access loading. Recommended choice up to 100,000 pounds. A 100,000 pound load cell weighs 57 pounds, so that gets pretty heavy pretty quickly. And a 200,000 weighs over 140, which people really do not want to cat, you know go out and um, carry 140. So 
in to that regard, it's about 100 pounds we find as a limit, and even people complain on that. A uh, 60 pound or 60,000 pound uh, version of this weighs about 30 pounds. That's uh, some people have that threshold, uh, depending on what you want. But this one, uh, zero return, since we were talking about it, how well do these re cells return? Really, really good. Uh, this one, about five counts. Uh, some of them go 12, uh, 12 to 20 counts, but you know, in general, very good zero return as well. So misalignment of an S-beam versus a shear cell. Here is S being with 0.75% misalignment error at the end of the day, 86.606. And here we deliberately misaligned the shear web cell. Uh, our expectation on this was that we'd have a uncertainty uh, about 0.46 and it went to 0.527. And then we have our budget line load cell uh, here that they are shear web load cells. They cost less. They're made of... Uh, most of them are made of stainless, uh, which is an expensive material, though they cost less and easy for simple applications such as weighing, test rig, E4, um, manufactured from durable corrosion resistant materials and are designed to withstand harsh environments. Uh, we keep a lot of these in stock and applications where the load cell is calibrated in place. Uh, it was perfect for testing machine applications because of the corrosion resistance. Uh, they're not painted like the other ones. They don't have that extra process, so they should withstand uh, the barrage of, of environmental and hazards that are you put upon them by technicians. Um, anybody knows that knows these load cells, you, you can bump them around, you fixture them up, the paint does come off of them. So the budget load cells really, really nice in that, that regard. And the performance characteristics are good. Keeping the line of force pure from eccentric forces is key to calibration of load cells. ASTM E74 does not address it, but ISO 376 does. Uh, the ISO 376 standard, it's 2011. It's It's been out for a while. The annex part is just a great value for anybody that wants to build their own adapters or look into building their own adapters. The recommendations in there are very, very good. And the standard costs are, I think, like $120 to $150, somewhere in there. So it's not too bad if you're looking to have something as a reference point. Now, we can make all the adapters. A lot of the tension members we make, and we make compression adapters that are uh, in line with ISO 376 as well. But standard gives guidance. You can go out and make it. It's just a matter of if you have the engineering and the capability to do it or you want to make it easier and pay somebody else to do it. Uh, there's just a funny cartoon about a misaligned load cell. My owners push me, pull me, side load me, twist me, distort me, and they do, care, do not care if my load path is right. Uh, and then course we don't do that and we're trying to train everybody else not to do that let's let's care about our instruments let's get the right adapters in place and let's start solving the problems and making better measurements that being said more adapters for alignment if if the load cell doesn't have one uh, these load buttons with radiuses can be used with uh, hardened pad or something else and for reference standards we really like the uh, ball adapters here and then I have a shot of ISO 376 uh, and it basically says load fitting should be designed in such a way that the line of force application is not distorted as a rule tensile force transducer should be fitted with two ball nuts two ball cups and if necessary with two intermediate rings while compressive force strain should be fitted with one or two compression pads then we look at adapters, tension adapters. If any of these look like in your calibration lab, there is a problem. If you're using these on your equipment sent in for calibration, there is a problem. Even straight threaded rod can introduce some error. So you're buying a load cell, you're buying equipment, your steps to choosing the right load cell. Hopefully we're choosing a load cell that, you know, like the shear web that we can misalign a little bit. And we can do some things that, that probably happen in the field and still get very good results. Now in tension, we want to make sure we have those right adapters. And this is where those kits come in and the ISO recommend, re recommendations come in uh, very well. So when you think about a load cell system, you need to start thinking about not only my load cell indicator cable and case, but we also need to start thinking about adapters and adapter sets and how we're going to calibrate them. So 
Uh, we have these. These are quick change kits. The benefit of these is basically on a cow lab or someone out that's calibrating testing machines. You have different size load cells. These are quick change adapters. One set of tension adapters that can be used for various different capacity load cells. And then here's some ISO recommendation on compressive force can transducers that should be fitted with one or two compression pads. And this is what ISO is drawing out. And then there's what we make. And what that looks like on a load cell is something like this uh, for ISO recommended adapters. You have your top adapter and then a base. Hopefully that made some sense on load cells. There's a lot of different ones. That budget load cell that we have is a real good value. If cost is a major concern, of course, I recommend the ultra cells. And then on the higher capacity, I recommend the multi columns. Uh, some really small forces, you might look at an S-beam. And when we get into that, uh, after we choose in our load cell or series of load cells, if we want to calibrate a lot of different uh, equipment, maybe we want to calibrate the 600,000 down to 100 pounds. And then maybe we'll have a combination of load cells from a multi-column, um, a, a single column or a multi-column and two shear webs. Once we've decided that and uh, we have guidance online, uh, for that uh, documents under documents and tools at Morehouse. We have guidance to, for selecting load cells for E74 work and other work. Once we've done that, we really want to look at our meters and figure out where do we want to go with this, right? The right load cell indicators. Do we have the last picture was one of some of the older ones and now we have some newer ones. Uh, these are interesting. This is a wireless option right here. If you needed a wireless load cell, it's e very easy to do. Uh, don't know why, uh, maybe lifting applications or some of the other ones. This is the new instrument, the new PSD that uh, replaces that old one. Uh, I showed the old old screen so people could recognize maybe they have that one and there's a newer one out. This does a little, adds a little bit more. And then we have these other indicators. We have our 4215 uh, high stability, we have a 4215 plus, we have a Hattie, and we have our C705P. We have other indicators besides this, but these are just some of them. And if you just start looking at specs, does the indicator have to be better than 005%? That's a, usually a linearity specification that's on there. Uh, the Hattie's at 002%. It's one of our better indicators, I think, overall cost wise for what you get. The downside of the Hattie is you need a computer to use it. It's a USB powered device and so you need a computer to convert to millivolt per volt. Do you require portability with a power adapter? Maybe some places you don't want to plug into the wall power so carrying a laptop might not be a bad thing. And Do you have two or more load cells? This indicator could have multiple load cells married to it. Our techs in the lab like it a lot. Or maybe somebody just needs something quick to check a press or something like that. Do you require portability without a power adapter? This PSD one operates on batteries. Uh, the big question here is do you only have one load cell or two? Uh, there, this only does two load cells unless you get into TEDs. And if you get into TEDs and all the other stuff, I would probably urge to consider a 4215 or something on the magnitude of that. Do you have more than two load cells? Do you want multiple span calibration points? All of this stuff is um, what we start looking at, uh, high stability. This 4215, you can, our computer program, Zach did a great webinar last month on the 4215, or in the computer program that uses the Hattie, the 4215, everything else. If you want to take data off of a computer, those these two indicators, either the Hattie or the 4215, are I should put check marks here, are great ones to have. If you want an indicator and do not want to have a computer and do not want to fumble around with as received as return, where your where your equipment needs adjusted, then these two indicators are awesome. Uh, and they are our C705P and our 4215 plus. And what I mean by awesome is they can reduce the bias, right? You have an indicator that you set up one year and you say, Morehouse, I want you to set this up. And year one, it reads 10,000 pounds. Year two, it comes back and reads 10,002. 
What do we do with this? Well, we don't adjust it. If it's an ASTM cal or if it has a spec, that's usually within spec. But here we have this two pound offset. What these indicators do is we do the cals in millivolts per volt, use a set of coefficients that are programmed into the indicator. When it comes back for calibration, we don't care whether it reads 10,000 or 10,002. We read it in millivolts and we supply a new calibration curve. So that goes away. And basically your as received as returned stay in the same units, millivolts. And it's automatically tweaked or adjusted to be as close as possible to nominal with the use of calibration coefficients. So the as received is the as returned. There's no adjustment. We reprogram new coefficients. Your meter stays, your calibration reports all stay in millivolts. And we use a math equation to convert them the same as the computer system does to engineering units. Why is this pretty awesome and has me really excited is because bias, bias sucks, right? We did a webinar like two months ago on bias and you have this and it's, it's, it should be corrected for uh, most standards say correct for no bias when you have it or it becomes part of a uh, overall uncertainty, right? Where we have our tr close to true value, which we don't know. Uh, we have our uh, evaluation of repeatability here, and then we have our type B evaluation. So not the greatest. Uh, this illustration summarizing terms for preferred a certainty approach is from the introduction to statistics and metrology. And it basically says the measure value will fall be within a total uncertainty um, below the true value. When we have bias, we add to this uncertainty. And what does that mean? Well, okay. I used an example of 10,002, but what if Year one, uh, the the meter reads 10,000. In year two, we have this measured value of 10,009. We have an offset of nine. Accuracy, someone says, hey, I need it to be plus or minus 10 pounds, so it's still in. It goes out of here, and we say it's okay, right? When you know the value to generate 10, 000, is 10,009, what do we have to do? We have to load to 10,009 to apply 10,000. Not many people do this. And what happens when you do it? Right, reference standard is not loaded to 10,009. They just load it to 10,000. Hey, we're loading 10,000. Right, even though my cal report says I need to load to 10,009. Well, what happens if we're making a calibrate another instrument? This picture shows it. If we only load to 10,000, our bias st starts off as nine off. And if we calibrate something else that has the same specification, one to one, ratio and then someone's going to say four to one i don't care what we, we get into this or not um when we don't correct it that risk shoots up uh pretty dramatically in, th in this situation that total risk is 87.67 percent uh the result of not correcting for the bias is a failed instrument that has been adjusted using a reference standard with a high bias and high measurement risk so we're actually loading to nine thousand 999 and not 10,000 when we do not correct for the bias that that causes us to call other instruments bad when they're good and other instruments good potentially when they're bad depending on which way that goes so really really important that we correct these instruments um, if we correct for them here's what happens we correct it for bias this is what those coefficients do when we you know do, do all the cows and millivolts and correct auto corrects so uh, you don't have to load the 10,009 for 10,000 it's auto corrected so if this were to come through on that total risk here if it's same still one to one scenario would be 1.02 percent so this is correcting for bias versus not correcting we run this through I know somebody's there but I use a four to one TUR okay Let's, let's go this scenario. So measurement uncertainty, what happens when, when we do not correct for the bias? Leaves Morehouse, measured value with bias, right? Leaves our lab, measured value, bias removed. So if we correct using coefficients, we can remove that bias and not have to manually do it. And we'll be at the right reading. So we don't correct for bias. Reference four to one, measurement uncertainty, 
right? Instead of now we're actually loading the second tier. We're actually loading at uh, 11 off. The third tier, 13 off. And these are random numbers. They can go any which way, right? Um, I'm using a formula to do this with different TURs. And the whole point of this is saying, really, TUR doesn't matter in this case because we are not correcting for bias. And when we don't do that, that's bad practice. And with bad practice comes the figure brochure when the reference laboratory does not correct for the bias and applies this, applies the difference of nine. I had newtons on the other side, this slides pounds. It can go, you know, whatever your instruments, same thing happens. In this scenario, instruments may have failed when they should have passed calibration. You can see this curve. If we're not correcting at every state, you can be 20, more than 20 count, 20 newtons, 20 pounds, force off. Hopefully that made sense, but here, I said the uh, our PSD, let's look at that. Let's look at our two meters and, and look at, if I did two points, I programmed in a two-point span and did this cow, right? A 10,000-pound device, I bought an indicator. I bought a good load cell. We can say great load cell, and I programmed in these two points. This is data from one of those. So I program in these two points. Look what happens on my indicator. Look at this error, these errors. And then same, same load cell, same set of points, and now I use coefficients. Look at my error using coefficients. And if we look at these differences, these are huge, huge numbers. So the calculated values come into almost as close as possible correcting using coefficients. Whereas if I just use the two point span, which many meters do, there's so many names out there, just start naming indicator names. Uh, and a lot of them use two or five point correction. And these errors happen because guess what? Our load cells are not perfectly linear. And then we have these errors. And when we have these errors, we sometimes do not correct for them. And then our uncertainties go up. And these differences are just gigantic, 22,109%, yeah, from 0.1 to, yeah, it's just absolutely uh, ridiculous on, on the side of all of these um, equations. So benefits of using meters that can use polynomial. Uh, I said it earlier, but when the reference laboratory reads and reports in millivolts for use using the least squares method, uh, the as received becomes the as, as returned, and you, user given a new set of coefficients to use. Um, the millivolt values are recorded and monitored. This is important because if you keep changing, I want it tweaked in, I want it tweaked in, and you're using your base units and force units, you kind of lose track if you can follow me. Um, like, when did I have it adjusted? When did I not this year? If we keep the units in just raw counts or millivolts, from the life of this meter and load cell, you can look at all of your data and really get a nice statistical estimation of what's happening year over year. And new coefficients are going to count for some of that drift that happens. Um, when, this, when we use this method, the cost for calibration is significantly reduced because we don't need to do two sets of cows. We don't need to do one, hey, here's your as received. Now we're going to go tweak and adjust your indicator. Here's your as return. We're going to apply the mathematical mathematical polynomial equation to it to tweak your as return. And then the analysis and history of stays in millivolts, so any doubt much easier, short and long term. So best load cell reference system. I uh, want to recommend some things if you wanted it. The 4215 plus high stability, our ultra precision shear web load cell. This thing over here, this is a load cell tester. I would employ, I would encourage uh, anybody to get one of these. It saved a ton of time in our lab. If you have a lot of load cells, if you're a Cal lab, or you have a lot of load cells that you're looking at uh, in your inventory, this instrument can quickly diagnose whether your load cell is good or bad, whether a technician has overloaded the load cell. It's about a thousand dollar device. Uh, we are not the only ones selling it, but I believe our price is one of the better prices, if not the best online. You can go look at LCC, LCT Ultimate, do a search on that one and see what everybody's selling them for and see what you want. Other, other recommendations. This is a, um, a pretty cheap uh, load cell simulator. 
I would recommend a better one, though this is just the reason I'm recommending this one and the cheaper one is not to calibrate our meters. Uh, it's just as a reference check, right? So I can check my system if I use a load cell tester. And if I'm getting some weird indicator readings, I could have this as a tool. It's like a five, six hundred dollar cheap load cell, cheaper load cell simulator for a quick reference check. I can, we can certainly do higher end simulators, but uh, most of the time for field use or reference use, this is good enough as long as we're not using it to calibrate our meters. This is a reference check only to, to check the entire system. Then we go start looking at uh, in system meeting indicator. Best value system uh, would be something like, hey, if I wanted to do, um, you know, 600,000, this mini load cell that weighs 27 pounds, another load cell, I still on value still recommend these two items and then if we go to just through these again best low cost value system took out the simulator on this one uh just depending or not the simulator the load cell tester and just looking at this meter uh which is cheaper than one of um less expensive than one of the uh big blue ones uh that a lot of people use for force measurement and the does not need to be reprogrammed all the time because we can use the coefficients on it and then our uh, budget load cells uh, shear web load cells with very very good performance uh, they do not match the ultras but they are somewhere between the precision and calibration grade that are painted and everything else so that and then we have still have the simulator so you can say hey let me just check things. Maybe I checked and see a technician did something. We're in menus that they shouldn't be. I can check my channels. I can do this. I can make sure my meter's not drifting, all of that. And then the lowest cost systems are these. Uh, these two meters have pricing that's about half of the other meters. Uh, they can be programmed with, with spans, uh, five point, seven point spans. You're still going to have that bias and offset, and as they drift, they're not going to be auto-corrected. You're going to have to pay for two calibrations, one for the as-received and one to adjust it if you want to remove the bias. Other things in here, I mean, they could be paired. Might be good enough to pair it if you're just checking the press that you need a 1% measurement, you need a half percent measurement, uh, good all day long. Even a 0.1% measurement, I would trust these all day long. If you wanted a reference cell, um, or you want to do calibration with ISO 7 to in accordance with ISO 7500 or e, ASTM E74 E4 any of that uh, you could do it uh, but there's there's a lot of corrections that need to happen on the indicator side not the load cell side I mean you could pair one of these budget load cells with a um, go back to this slide here this this is going to be a really great system uh, for for many and very cost effective system and then we have super mini micro there's manu there are people out there that are making these mini load cells and selling them for six seven hundred dollars these are le a much less expensive than that i don't love the mini load cells but they are good for low force uh, measurements uh, when price is a concern and then since you've attended this uh, we do have this pdf that'll come out to everybody and you can see load cell indicator comparison charts you can see 4215 plus can have two channels um, uh, you can compare this this is what i was comparing earlier this meter is less expensive than this meter and this meter has coefficients but this meter does not and a lot of people that are doing testing the e4 uh, like this meter so are encouraging uh, we encourage people to consider the c705p because they'll get closer uh, and eliminate that bias in all of this and we spelled handheld wrong might have pulled that out but uh yeah this is the general you can look at this chart and everything else and then certain things guidelines choose an indicator based on your accuracy and uncertainty requirements choose based on wired or wireless Choose based on environmental conditions, uh, four and six wire sensing. Uh, if you run four wire cables, they're subject to additional errors with temperature, cable runs, and system would need to be recalibrated if anything happened to the cable. If you run six wire uh, sensing systems, which most of those, most of these indicators were, 
Uh, most of these were this is this is six right here, six wire, right, six wire, why that matters, six wire, six wire, six wire. Why that matters is cable length, um, cable uh, gauge, all that stuff, gauge, gauge like you know, 18 gauge cable versus 24 gauge cable, long uh, runs, temperature differentials, are all those errors are drastically decreased to minimal uh, with six wire sensing system. Two is based on the ability to use coefficients. Hopefully I made the case for that. Based on price, ease of use, ruggedness, and the number of load cells and channels required. And after you choose all of that, I encourage everybody to consider either you build them yourself, buy these from Pelican, Storm, wherever you want to buy them, buy these shipping cases and put foam in them. It is so much better than having to do this because every time someone packs with the good and double boxes things, it's great to receive it this way, but it's not very efficient or effective in transporting your load cells from place to place, depending if you're using them for field or the or lab use. Uh, that's up to people. I just, I love the Pelican cases. Our damage, the incidence of damage with these cases, uh, I think there's three incidents in 10 years um, and the uh, sample size would be about probably about 20,000 shipments. So that's that's pretty impressive. Whereas this type of thing, the bad and the ugly, when people do this, your incidence in shipping damage is probably close to 20 to 50 percent. Uh, this one is that custom blow foam uh, heavy load cell on a cable and it just beats all around here and more likely than not this arrives here and we have a severed cable if it's a four wire system now you've lost your as receive we can patch the cable but you have extra repair work and the ugly is just throw something on a crate and, and throw some box around it but think about it um cases are these pelican cases they almost pelicans good they replace latches they do other things you spent money on whatever load cell system you've spent it on, and you might as well keep it safe. So, uh, and UPS doesn't like UPS, FedEx. They all do not not like paying claims and find ways not to do it. So, if we're looking at all this, uh, the conclusion is choose the right load cell for your application. Uh, is not S beams are not going to perform as well. They are cost effective for some things, and if purchasing decides, I'll buy this $200 load cell, but I'll pay $600 to have it calibrated. Something doesn't really make sense in that equation to me. Uh, choosing a readout that is stable with enough resolution, uh, that's something else we want to look at. Choose an indicator where the as received is the same as the as return, and adjustments are done via correction factors. Uh, I highly recommend that. Let's eliminate bias from the equation. And then none of this matters if your calibration provider cannot calibrate the accuracy required. Namely, meaning if you need something to be good to say, someone's determined to say, hey, I need this to be 0.2%, and you go look at your calibration provider's website, and the best they can do on their scope is 0.05%, help me out, right? 0.05% is greater than 0.02 so they really can't do your cal to the results that you want it to so you really need to be checking the um, scope of accreditation and see what their best capability is and then you need to be asking them is that the capability that's going to apply to my equipment or not because sometimes they use different equipment and recommended reading uh, still promoting this came out the metrology handbook came out at you know at the end of last year uh, just so happy to be part of it there's lots of good chapters there's a chapter on force chapter on decision rules chapter on uh, best practices that's chapter 40 uh, just a great great book and reference that's out and available hardback you can get it Heather Wade you search the author here if you're interested in it and buy an autographed copy from her site and then we have force calibrations for technicians. This is our free ebook. You go to our website, just fill out the form. This is 200 and some pages of all things force, things I've talked about today, other things. If you want to go into coefficients, degree fits, all of that is in there. And then this is an old, oldie but goodie, strain gauge based transducers, uh, their design and construction. 
SGBT uh, was published uh, by Viché Measurement Group, Raleigh, North Carolina, can still be found online. Just an excellent document on uh, load cells, their construction, uh, where they're, what's good and what's bad about the certain design characteristics. Uh, just a fantastic, if, if you're inner engineer or design uh, enthusiast in you wants, uh, wants some good reading, uh, that, that, that is great for this uh, this session right here. Other things, YouTube videos, uh, we're going to have some more. We're going to have a new guidance document on mass to force. It's like 25 pages of guidance on, you know, what, how people do the wrong things, and namely torque manufacturers selling mass weights with the torque system and not force. Uh, that error can be uh, up to a half percent just on gravity alone. Uh, and I see a lot of scopes where people are claiming 0.1% uh, or better. Uh, it doesn't happen if you don't adjust your weights for force and make the proper correction. So that, that book's going to be coming out. If you follow us on LinkedIn, uh, please do. Uh, this following right here, follow us on LinkedIn. If you want to know when that guidance is coming out, it will first be posted on LinkedIn. You'll know immediately when we have the link. Right now, that guidance is in draft, and it should be out within a couple weeks uh, on the on the mass to force. And then we have free tools online on our website and our contact information. But please, if you want to stay in the loop, go to our webpage, download the force calendar, the ebook for technicians. And please follow us uh, on LinkedIn because that's we're going to announce almost everything anymore on LinkedIn. Right, we're up to like 2,300 followers right now. This one's a little older. And, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for attending. I see there's some questions, and I'll answer them. Uh, I'm going to end the recording and answer the questions.